This episode of Three Black Guys with the Mic is being brought to you by Wendy's. Wendy's has changed the value game all over again. Today, grab yourself a four for four. A juicy junior bacon cheeseburger or crispy chicken BLT large fry four-piece nugget and a drink. You can always get it fresh, never frozen at a participating Wendy's. Offer not valid in Alaska and Hawaii. Now let's start the show. First of all, let me tell you something. Lamont is just full of Sometimes my mama said, you know, you don't have nothing nice to say. You should be quiet. You say that Stephen A. is a coon. You agree with that? Everybody got quiet on that one, okay? Uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, 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 Rudy Giuliani practices voodoo. What? So he put a voodoo hex on my girl, Hillary, and that's why she got woozy. Yo. And, and the Secret Service had to prop her up and put her in the van. But take us to a break, my dude. Take us to a break. It was voodoo, son. I don't know about it that was voodoo. voodoo. Hi, right, so ladies and gentlemen, welcome. This is Three Black Guys with a Mic. Welcome to another episode of Three Black Guys with a Mic. It is Spud Maynard Lamont. We are all in the building. Welcome to another episode. We are honored to be joined by political strategist, speaker, advocate, president of the Brooklyn NAACP, national board member of the PAC, just all around beautiful woman, Eljoy Williams. Eljoy, thank you so very much for joining Three Black Guys with the Mic. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so very much for having me. I appreciate it. No problem. So let's get into a little bit of the backstory of L. Joy Williams and, you know, how you decided that you wanted to be a political strategist and an advocate and, you know, where you're from. And let's get a little bit of the journey of L. Joy Williams. Oh, boy. How much time you got? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're about to get married, you so you don't got that kind of time. You don't got that much time. <laughs> Well, um, you know, I actually, actually doing political work was my backup. I wanted to be a fashion designer literally up until my senior year of high school. And I had always been involved. I come from a heavy church background. So I'd always had social justice and um, community work as part of who I was uh, because that's who my family is. And, you know, so that, so politics was really my backup. And I was going to be a fashion designer who, when I retired, would get elected to the U.S. Senate. <laughs> and uh, I applied to FIT. I got into FIT high school, but not the college. And I was like, ah, I guess I'll do my backup of politics. <laughs> and so I just, you know, married sort of doing political and electoral work with the work that I was doing in my community um, in terms of social justice. Uh, from my family's background and just been doing it ever since. So that was, um, I made that decision around 17, 18, and um, I'm 38 now and I've been doing it for that long. You know, in regards to political strategy, you know, uh, let's talk about the current election that just happened in 2016. In your opinion, what happened? <laughs> I mean, did the Republicans in the Trump administration win it fair and square? You know, did Hillary Clinton just not have the right message? Did she not resonate with a particular, um, you know, type of voter or section of voters? You know, did she not just get out and work, you know, i.e. Wisconsin and Michigan, you know, or, you know, did Donald Trump just outwork her? You know, from a strategy perspective, what 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 did the Democrats do wrong? Well, the, actually, the response to that is a little bit of all of what you just said okay. um, <laughs> contributed to that, right? Like, so, and people make the mistake, even sometimes pundits do this on news programs, where they make the mistake and say, this one thing is what lost the election, or this one thing is what, you know, made this person win. And the truth is, uh, is that there is a combination of things um, that contribute to the environment, contribute to what the outcome of an election or a political climate will be in general. Um, and so while I know it's a great thing to do for like article clicks and, mm -hmm. you know, TV to say it's this one thing, the truth is that it's a combination of a lot of things as to the reason why we're not only uh, resulted in a Donald Trump presidency, but the uh, toxic nature of politics and the state of where we are in general. There are a lot of things that contribute to that. Um, so one is uh, the, the status of the parties 
um, in the candidates that they chose. Um, so there obviously was a lot of history and a, also a lot of baggage in terms of the Democrats, in terms mm-hmm. of um, uh, having Hillary Clinton as the nominee. At the same time, I don't think the party really recognized um, and fully understood um, what was really going on with the Democratic base, uh, what was bubbling um, up in terms of the progressive community in general, right? That there was this uh, conversation that that bubbled over in terms of moderate Democrats or middle of the road folks and the left wing of the party. Um, and I think they underestimated um, being able to hear and speak to the concerns and the needs of a certain part of the party. Um, at the same time, I don't think on the other on the other side, in terms of the Republican Party, they had no clue <laughs> that uh, Donald Trump would sort of rise up um, from among you know what they were expecting as well. Everyone was expecting sort of these um, traditional Republicans. I mean, just look at how many people were sort of in the race and the. T- types of people that were in the race. Their talent and their bench that they were looking at were governors and senators and, you know, other people. That was the talent that people were cultivating for over, you know, for over some time. So in that context, here come some disruptors, right, that speak to some of the issues that um, different aspects of the, the respective parties' bases um, were not being um, uh, addressed on uh, the Democratic side, right? You had this um, a, a liberal side or um, progressive side that you had this candidate, Bernie Sanders, that comes up and really speaks to people um, and, you know, galvanize a part of the base that hadn't or a part of the electorate, at least on the progressive side, that wasn't really excited about a Hillary Clinton candidacy um, so because let me, let me, of the let me, you, let me ask you a mm-hmm. quick question here, Aldra. So, and and I think what probably, I, I, in my opinion, there are a couple of things um, that need to be said. Like, so on paper, like I'm a great applicant for ser- several jobs, but if I screw up in the interview, then I'm not necessarily the best candidate. And I exactly. think there was a lot of things that, for instance, not to say that it was a one-off situation with Hillary, that it was just that she didn't do Michigan or Wisconsin in, in, the, in the right fashion. But would you say that in, uh, I guess it was uh, June of 15 or, or, or May of 15, when you know we began, or was it 16? Yeah, it was May of 15. We started hearing about the email server that Hillary never had a solid answer to say, you know what, let me just... Let me just answer this right now and say and put this to bed. And and, and I liken this as a you know as a you know someone who holds a master's in, in uh, broadcast communications and public relations. Now you see what we're saying, Eljoy. Now you see what we're saying. Now at least at least now you know what we're no, saying. But I liken it to with David Letterman. He's flexing again. He's, yeah, he's, he's flexing again. He's flexing again. Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, come company, on, bring it down, bring it down. So you don't, to, you know. I liken this to when David Letterman said. Yo, this guy is trying to blackmail me for ten million dollars because he says I slept with his wife, and I'm gonna just tell you, I slept with his wife, and then it was over with. Like he dealt with it in one night, and it was no longer a story. She let that thing dog her from, you know, mid mid 2015 all the way until November 7th, 2016. Or, or am I wrong? Mm. So here's where you're wrong. Um, is that uh, yes. yes uh, any other candidate, um, first of all, you already, have... you already pissed me off now. No, 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 man, man, man. Look, give her a space. Give her a space. Yes. Give her a space now. Give her a space. Thank you so very much. Finally. Thank you. Go ahead. El joy. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. I was prepared to have like a like a little cop, a back and forth, but the mom said, yes. I was like, damn, I just, <laughs> so, so here's why. Um, and this is why I said the baggage of a candidate vers- and also the history of a candidate is really important here. Because yes, in a traditional and a normal sense, a candidate coming out and having a strong response to that criticism um, and not letting you know a scandal, a perceived scandal like that drawn out um, would have been great. But the reality is, is that Hillary Clinton is hasn't been in a very long time a normal and traditional candidate. And so whether or not it was the email server, um, it would have been something else. 
because one of the things that people forget is that Hillary Clinton was a known entity, right? right. And um, yeah. for a very, very long time, both for people who supported her and people, remember, there are people that absolutely hated her. Right. So whether it was the email server or anything else, it something would have continued to be a story for her candidacy, just because that is the type of candidate and um, the history that she has had in our political discourse. So if this was any other candidate, I would have agreed with you. And in fact, it, that had played out. Um, with uh, Bernie Sanders, another candidate, that there were different things that were introduced in the discourse, th you know, uh, things about uh, his past as a, a mayor, as, you know, things that he voted for. Remember, he voted for the crime bill as well, right? So, like, all of those things, but it never stuck, according to um, his base. He, and he didn't have great responses to it all the time, right, in terms of the criticism as well. The difference is, Hillary Clinton was a known entity and a very hated entity by a number of people. And so whether it was going to be the email, um, the perceived email scandal or something else, that was going, it, it was going to be some sort of scandal that followed the rest of her candidacy. Uh -huh. So, so Eljoy, let, let, let me ask you a question. First, let me say that I'm kind of like a, a, a Uber fan of, um, cause I listened to you when you're on there with the Rev and, and, and I'm, I'm going to lighten it up a little bit, but try to go a little heavy at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, the Rev has an organization, the National Action Network, that you know I'm I'm kind of very familiar with. You know, me originally being from Detroit, although I live in Jersey now. They, you know, they have a very big. Uh, more <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, why I call Jersey, by the way. Okay. <laughs> no, no, okay. <laughs> you know, f so I, I kind of want to figure out. You know, w we're here with Donald Trump now. You know, with all of the things that you guys are talking about. What, what what happened before, you know, and, and but we're here. And my question is, you know, with organizations like the National Action Network and other what I like to call organizations that may be on the ground, what, what what's the plan? Like, how do we make sure that this disaster doesn't happen again? And then my second part is, is, you know, did somebody really have a conversation with the Rev about the selfie? <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> you know we love the Rev, you, you understand? And, oh but, my but I, I, you know, and even I heard the Rev say, you know, that he did have some of the of 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 his younger constituents have a conversation. And I just want to know, were you in on that meeting? Did we just tell the <laughs> Rev to let's, let's be cool? With, I'm we down with the dancing because I, you know, he's down with James. He was down with James Brown. I'm cool, but did we talk about the selfie? And what's the plan? What do we do? You know, when it's time to do this again. All right. So let me start with the easy one. I would dare not have a conversation with Rev about a selfie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you leave that one up to Jay-Z. Um, leave that one up to Jay-Z. Listen, I know my lane. And one of the things I learned from him, actually, um, and I learned this pretty on in my career, I've known, you know, known and worked with him for some time, is he always talks about people staying in their lane, knowing what your lane is and work like doing whatever is your lane is and doing that to the best of your ability. Everybody has a, a part to play. My part in his life is not talking to him about no selfie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let us clarify. Clear. Hold on one second. Let us clarify. When we talk about the Rev at this point, we talk about Reverend Al Sharpton. Yeah. So, yeah. There are some people who don't, who are not. Oh, familiar. people don't know that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, some people may not Maynard, know. Maynard, that Maynard, that Maynard, Maynard, Maynard. Okay. There's only <laughs> one Rev. Maynard. These let her breathe. Let her breathe. Come mind. on. Come on. Let her breathe. Anyway, go ahead, L. Joy. I'm sorry. Hold on. Reverend Ike don't count no more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm sorry, L. Joy. Excuse them. Continue on, please. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, yes, that is um, um, not my uh, uh, role for him. But um, in terms of what the plan is, uh, organizations and individuals do have plans. Um, and people are under the impression um, that there is, and I would include us in this conversation in terms of people who live African descent or Black folks as well, um, that uh, there has to be there has to be one plan that we all have to meet at a convention center and decide what the plan is and move forward with um, that plan. Now that would be great um, if everybody would be able to stay on message, meet in secret, and not talk about what the plan was <laughs> and do and do everybody do what they're supposed to do. But even amongst you um, uh, fine fellows, I am sure that you guys don't always stick on plan either. Uh, oh. So 
Um, the, while the organization, some of, I guess, the larger civil rights organizations, the leaders sort of talk and de determine what's the best way to push who's going to be out front and, you know, do the, the extra loud bullhorn voice and who's going to be behind the scenes sort of working on policy. Those conversations do happen. Um, but I think overall what the plan is, is for people to identify um, what specific things that they can do, um, do well and do consistently and engage our larger community in, in order to push our agenda forward. Because Eldr the plan is a plan that's multifaceted and on, diff on all levels. It's not just one particular plan that everybody follows. We are six months into this campaign, right, into the Trump mm -hmm. administration. And we debate, and I want you to debate this with us. You know, we debate this all the sure. time in regards to, is Donald Trump winning, right? Lamont thinks that, you know, he is winning, right? And Maynard and I continue to tell him he's not winning. He's like, has the lowest approval rating in any history. Nothing is yeah, getting no, passed. Of course, yeah, in regards no. to the health care, they can't get it passed, so forth and so on. But, of course, one black guy, one third of the black guys think that he's winning with the base. Is that an accurate statement or is Donald Donald Trump losing across the board? Well, um, here's another, this is another thing that I, I think as uh, pundits and people living, currently living in a historical piece, um, you know, often have trouble with, right? We're not going to know the, the, the totality, the totality of this, um, or what this means in terms of our culture, our politics and our society, for some time. We just aren't. There are some medium, some immediate like hot takes you can take away in terms of what needs to change or how our democracy needs to evolve um, when you have someone like this who can rise to the presidency and then what it does to our government overall. Um, but then there are the there is the time that you need. I say this, I make the same argument about the Black Lives Matter movement, right? Is that we need the time and distance to be able to accurately assess what this means to our society and our cultural, our culture overall. So when you make the statement of Donald Trump is winning, the question I then have is winning what, right? Mm -hmm. So is he winning hearts and minds in terms of uh, growing his base or growing support? I would say no. Is he winning with the people that elected him, that wanted him to be this perceived fighter for the common man, which, which in my opinion, he is not at all. He's actually the opposite of that. But, but for people who support him and support his attitude, his uh, approach and all of that stuff, is he winning with them? Mm, I would say medium, yes. Like you see some minor cracks, but again, I don't think the polls are really going to show that because the polls really didn't show um, those, those, that base of people in, to begin with, right? So when you say he's winning, you have to talk about when. Is he winning a le legislation? Obviously not. Is he going to win on this budget? I doubt it, <laughs> but, but, you know, that remains to be seen. So I about winning, you have to define what that is. His definition of win changes day by day. Right. So he is always going to win in court in his eyes because the goalpost moves every day. So, Eldra, I just want to go on record and just say that you are the best because what you just did is you echoed what I try to tell these other two black guys is that there's a certain Donald Trump supporter who is going to support him <sighs> to no end, no matter how horrific he does. And you said it best. And, Maynard, we talked about this at the last podcast. This guy has zero legislative wins. Zero. Somebody even said that, you know what, by the end of year two, he's still going to be at zero. But there's a certain segment of this country, again, that is on the Trump train, period. And they ain't getting off. They got first class tickets and they are serving <laughs> cocktails in the front of the plane or the train. And yeah. That's, just, that's, that's it. I mean... M Maynard, I mean, I, I just we have someone who agrees with me and does not just not agree with you in that. Well, she didn't agree with you one hundred percent. No, no, no. no she gave up. me a little. She gave me like she gave you a little bit. Spuds, she gave you a little spuds, bit. Spuds, spuds, spuds. Can you mute him? Can you mute him for just a moment? <laughs> I got a question to ask real quick, or at least something to bring up. So, and, and for folks who are just kind of joining us, we're speaking with L. Joy Williams, who is a political strategist. She's the president of Brooklyn NAACP and a mover and shaker in politics in um, 
nationwide. I, I discovered um, uh, a lot about her or learned a lot about her first learned of her on MSNBC. And that's kind of where I want to kind of turn to with a two parter. And that is. Um, <laughs> That was so eloquent, don't you agree? That was so eloquent. <laughs> he's so he's so he's so he's, oh, he's articulate. Yeah, he's awesome. He's articulate. You know, and so MSNBC has had um done has done a great deal to really attract, obviously, I think the, the liberal or the left or, or Democrats, whatever you may call them. And I think most of my friends who are African American as well, um, turn to MSNBC or when and several of my Republican friends or conservative friends turn to Fox. And we have um, expected MSNBC to kind of be kind of the, the voice of our kinds of people, the Democrats, to some extent. I think that they have a little bit more balanced ju- uh, journalism than Fox, but, you know, you know that's, what, that's my opinion. Can we get to the question, please? The question is this. <clears throat> Here recently, <laughs> they just put Ari Melber on at 6 p.m. They had Greta Van Susteren on at 6 p.m. And in a world where Julianne Reed is working weekends, where Melissa Harris Perry gets left off, where Taryn Hall can't get back on, how do we add Nicole Wallace and, and Stephanie Rule and Ali Velshi and we and, and our brothers and sisters who are uh, are definitely Democrats as well? And you know, do you think that our voice as African Americans that we're being included? in a national media voice in the fashion that we should be similar to other people like Nicole Wallace, Greta Van Susteren, Ari Melber, Stephanie Rue, Ali Valshi, and others, Steve Karnacki, et cetera. Hmm. So, right. What was the question again? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let me answer this in two parts, right? There's the representation on national media or mainstream media response. And then there's response in terms of who and what we're getting our uh, news from. So on the representation front, I would agree with you um, that particularly if you look at MSNBC numbers um, and consistent numbers, they should invest more in having a more diverse uh, host lineup. Um, But even as someone who goes on MSNBC often, um, and that's because of the host um, who invite me, um, mainly Joy. Mm -hmm. Um, And before that, um, Steve did when he had a show and then Melissa. Um, Mm -hmm. So it was the, the host and then a couple of producers that, you know, sort of, you know, bring me on. I, I do think I'm actually unsatisfied with the format and the pace in which mainstream news happens right now. Um, because the it is a sort of chicken and egg kind of thing where the focus is on hot takes and who can you know get the most clicks and eyeballs and whether or not that it is elevating the conversation and giving uh, people uh, useful and um, intellectual conversation um, for people to be able to fully participate um, and be self-governing. I, I think that th- there is a lack there. Let um, me act- I'm sorry. So I-, I, so I would say that, yes, I agree with you um, for my girl, Tamron, for my girl, Joy, <laughs> you know, for a, a whatever that, yes, there needs to be more balanced representation. Um, but I also don't believe that I don't necessarily agree with. Let's have a network that's for progressives. Let's have a network for because I don't, I don't. I wish we didn't have that. Um, let me, um, let me ask you this in regards to let's, let's. You know, I, I want to go into advocate advocacy and as well as you know the Democratic Party. You know, especially let's start with the local level because you wrote an essay in regards to why it's important to vote. You know, on the local level, you know, saying those of us with years of you know the struggle under our belts, we need to be patient and inclusive. You know, with the new folks of new folks who are ready to learn and work. We know historically, and again, I mean, you could correct me if I'm wrong on this, but we show out on the presidential elections. We don't typically show out on, you know, show up, I should say, you know, when the, with the local and the state elections. How can we energize millennials and 
us, you know, people from a local perspective to get involved more on a local level so we can take back, you know, I'm only speaking from a Democratic perspective, you know, um, the, the, the House and the Senate. What's the narrative to people who don't vote locally? Mm. Um, so I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to answer that, but I'm going to finish my second part on the first one. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So I my would bad. say, <laughs> my bad. So I would say also, we have to determine in terms, if you want to talk about what's our plan, what's our agenda, um, uh, for us to focus, I think we also have to seek out and support other sources of news and information. We do that now. I'm sure you guys do that now in terms of hosting a podcast. And it's the reason why I started a podcast as well, um, because more and more people are starting to listen, listen to them. It's a captive audience. Hashtag Sunday um, civics, hashtag Sunday civics. <laughs> Just a little puppy. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, but I think also we have to like, do you have, and I'm, and believe me, I'm not calling like, this is not a call out thing. Cause I did this to another host and they were upset. Um, but do you have a subscription or do you get sources of news from other black papers, from other black media, from, um, other progressive media, right. That provides more, uh, or just middle of the road, just, we're just going to report the facts and the information and don't have a bias either way. Um, and I think, you know, part of the reason why sort of the mainstream media and MSNBC and Fox and all this other stuff gets more, you know, eyeballs is because people just go to them and sort of don't diversify where they get their news from other than Facebook. Um, to your other question about how do we get more people involved locally, um, it, it, it really begins with uh, us, you individually, um, having a greater focus on your local elections and your local governing, right? Remember that our, our setup is supposed to be one in where the people um, help govern. Well, you can't do that if you don't even know or are involved in what the policies are, the laws are being made on your local level. Do you have trash pickup, um, you know, in your community? Or did, you know, some voters some time ago decide, yeah, we don't want the government in our trash. And that's the reason why you have to pay for trash pickup or take trash yourself. Right. So like all of those things. And, and, and that's the that level of government is actually how people in, interacts with people's daily life more than the president does. So will Trump's uh, health care policy or budget have a negative or positive impact on our lives? Yes, because these are big you know, issues. But on a day-to-day -day basis, in terms of what your sales tax is, in terms of whether or not you can have a curb cut in front of your house so you can have a driveway, um, in terms of whether you have a tax abatement on a new condo, you're about, all of that is done on the state and local level. And so when you are not engaging on that level, you are giving up the decisions in terms of something that affects you to somebody else who may not share your best interests. So let me ask you this, L. Joy, um, and I, I think this is important because we discuss this quite frequently about who is on deck. And one of the things I, I said was, when Barack Obama, who was arguably one of the best presidents in the, at least in the past, uh, at least back through Kennedy, maybe you know in the, you know, obviously I'm biased. So, um, but when he picked Hillary as his Secretary of State, I think that was a message to all of up and all of the rest of the up and coming Dems that hey, she's next. And as a result, that may have kind of made people like a, maybe a Gavin Newsom or whoever there may be, Julian Castro, say, oh, I, it's not my turn. Therefore, it created a scenario where our bench became short uh, being a Democrat. So now as a result, we're having a hard time finding, uh, you know, really excellent Democrats who are on a rise that have a, that have a big superstar name in the, up to the point where we just had a tour where the the deputy where uh, Perez was marching around with um, Bernie Sanders saying this is the Democratic love tour or whatever it was called. Do you, who's who's on the horizon for us? <laughs> well, I have all sorts of comments about that. So first of all, um, we can't let others again. This is when people have to contribute and be part of the process um, to say that our bench is short. Um, it means that you agree with 
sort of who the powers that be and that they haven't identified anybody. Um, and that's simply, and, and it's simply not true. There are people on that bench. The powers that be are just like, oh, they're not sexy enough. They don't raise enough money. They don't look a certain way and therefore they're not viable. Um, but I would say that if you look, I mean, we have black, black folks running for governor uh, right now. You have Stacey Abrams running in Georgia. Um, who was the majority leader in um, the, uh, the state legislature there? That's a huge, you know, like, who's your, why, if she were not a Black woman, she would be on everybody's, you know, uh, uh, wish list in terms of who the bench was, right? Um, obviously, um, two other people on the national level who are being floated are Kamala Harris and Cory Booker. Um, you have a young brother in Florida, um, uh, who is uh, running for governor as well. And then if you look um, at all of the state legislatures um, and city council members and, you know, mayors of small towns um, all across the country, there are people there that are people of color, that are women, that are white men as well, um, who make up that bench that aren't the traditional uh, candidate. And when I say traditional candidate, I'm talking about a, a white, uh, young, Kennedy-looking S can raise a whole bunch of money um, with, pr with a pretty family that we need to put up and everybody, you know, vote for in the next presidential election. Be careful, um, girl. Be careful now. You're talking about massa now. Stop. Uh, this stop. <laughs> stop, man. Be nice. Be nice. So, so, None so, of which... And, and, you know, what's funny is that, so my latest critique to the party, um, you know, about their lack of investment um, and focus on Black women, which is the, the one of the primary bases of the Democratic Party. And, you know, people, you know, are like, oh, you're just trying to get a check and you're just trying to, you know, trying to get a job. I was like, I got a job. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, and my, and my soon-to-be husband do, too. Like, I'm not looking specifically for a job. If I'm a member of a party, and like I keep saying, closed mouths don't get fed. If right. I'm a member of a party, if I'm a member of a group of an organization, which is not addressing my issues, and I make up the primary base and are, am a consistent voter um, for that party and for its candidates, and they're not addressing my issue, it would be stupid of me not to speak up and to stay. So you're telling me not to not to watch MSNBC no more. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not what I said. <laughs> or stay in the or or stay in the Democratic Party. Oh wait, wait a minute. Diversify. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, hold on. I said diversify. I said diversify the sources of news. Um, the, the, your sources. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't be completely upset if um, Black folks, either collectively or Black women, individually just went independent. And I'm not saying we all going over to the Republican side. Some of us may, because we have Black women who are conservative. Um, but, you know, it's perfectly fine with me to make people pay, you know, to demonstrate that they value your vote and value your voice. So, Eljoy, let me ask you this question. First, I want you to tell us a little bit more about your podcast because, you, you know, we mm -hmm. kind of brushed over it. And, and when you tell us a little about, about the podcast, hopefully you, you I, I want to figure out how do we talk to that person that may be in Cleveland, Ohio, or in St. Louis, or in Baton Rouge? W what do they do? Do they go, like, what if they want to get, like, like Spud talked about, get, get into the local election where do they go? Where do they go to 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 be around like like minded people? Like wh what kind of resource is it? Your podcast because I feel like there's not like a a roadmap to that to that you know that millennial or even certain people you know in in my age group we don't want to I don't want to shout out my age group you know what we're called but they just don't know and they <laughs> they need a resource. Can they start with your podcast because I get a lot of people you know that that get a lot of information from Mainers so it's like where it's a little bit more raw and uncut. So is, is your podcast part of a, a, that destination or could you recommend some things for just that beginner that that's not may, maybe not as advanced as Maynard? Mm -hmm. Hashtag Sunday civics, hashtag 45. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, my $5 to y'all on the side is working. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, obviously I would encourage anybody to uh, listen to the show. So the show is Sunday civics. 
And it really came out of, you know, I do a lot of workshops, trainings, I, you know, do speaking everywhere about being engaged in the political process. Um, and over, you know, now 15 years of, uh, of doing that or a little more, um, one of the, th- one of my, uh, greatest thing is teaching people about the process and teaching people uh, more about their power in a political process um, as a individual and also as a collective. Um, And one of the things I recognize is people um, have this idea of what civics is, and it's only one part. Um, I like to describe actually the episode that's coming out this coming Sunday is I describe um, uh, civic participation in three parts. There's the civic values that we have, and that's the most that people identify with, right? You should be a good neighbor, you should be a good citizen, you should follow laws, you should not litter, (laughs) you know, like all of those kinds of things in terms of our values of who you should, you know, of who you should be and who you should be to one another. But the things that are lacking are civic knowledge and civic skills, right? It's the civic knowledge of knowing who do I, what, what issues do I go to my city council member with versus what I go to my state legislators with versus what I go to my senators with, voting on the budget that I can testify at a hearing, you know, all of those kinds of things and sort of how I make an impact on policy and politics. And the other part about it is skills. The only skill that we get pumped, you know, from school into every four years is you got to vote, you got to vote, you got to vote. Well, I mean, civic action is more than just voting. It doesn't begin and end on election day, right? If your city council is discussing, you know, increasing the sales tax, like what impact is that going to have on your pocketbook? What impact is that going to have on your business, you know, if you own a retail business? Um, And then being able to participate either as an individual or a collective of store owners, a collective of consumers and fighting against or trying to increase um, sales tax, whichever, you know, value you have either way. Um, And so what I saw was a need for more focus on civic knowledge and skills and giving people the information on how to interact with government beyond just checking a box, pulling a lever or bubbling in something every four years. Um, And that's really what the show is about. So we, you know, sort of break down some of these conversations that you may see on MSNBC, Fox or CNN. Um, We have an episode coming about identity politics, right, that's being used as something negative. Um, is that we need to get away from identity politics. We don't need you to identify as black or a woman or having a vagina. We need you to just talk whoa, about this whoa. policy. Oh, is that a bad word to y'all? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> this got my tell attention. you about the magical powers of a vagina. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> well, hold on, now. Wait a minute. Are right. you getting married? That's, a, that's, gonna be, that. that's, right, that's part two. That's part two of this podcast. Part two of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Eldred, let, Eldred, I got. I want to. I want to kind of give you three quick ones. And just trying to find out where we are and what, what's going on, and, and and I'll let you, you know, finish this off for us. One is um, talk a little bit about um, uh, it was actually a two parter for the first one. You know, where we are civically, if you will, that uh, we have a president that um, has appointed his um, son in law and his daughter to positions, and has has mused on the concept of I can just pardon myself and my authority as um, one of his henchmen (laughs) once said, is unquestioned. Um, And it sounds a little bit like a monarchy. Um, So I think that was actually two questions there. Um, And and then the third question um, is, for people who don't know you or are meeting you for the first time, what would they be surprised about uh, if they heard three different things on your radio or iPod or iPad, whatever you... The three things that you're currently playing, whether it be podcast, music, or other, that would surprise us to know about you. <laughs> um, let's see. So I'll start with the latter. So people would be people are always surprised how I mean, not that I'm a nerd. People are not surprised about that. Um, but um, that I read comic books. Because by no um, means do you sound like a nerd, none whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, so I do read comic books, um, and have for a long time. Um, so people are often surprised about that, but people are then also surprised that I can build things. Like I can, um, uh, build a speaker from scratch. I've built like closets. 
Like, Whoa. like I'm MacGyver. Okay. <laughs> so like I can. I, I heard you built your own studio in in, that, in one of your podcasts. You said yes, you built your own studio. Yes, I did. And I <clears> once <throat> let me tell you how MacGyver. My MacGyver story is: I once cooked an entire Thanksgiving dinner for ten people in a hotel room. Mm. Wow. Wow. Nobody got salmonella. <laughs> right. Nobody got a whole a whole turkey, uh, pies, um, bread from scratch. Yeah. Did so, anybody get yeah, anything on the saying. floor? Did anybody get what? anything on the floor? <laughs> <laughs> what's, on, what's, what's on? If I'm the, if you and I let her finish, but why you keep let just let her finish? She knows how to answer the questions. She knows how to answer the questions. No, no, she she she's playing. I you, hear she already I cut me off and said, "Listen, you cut me off, and you know what? I needed to answer my question back." She knows how to answer the question. Let her answer the questions, man. That's because she you scared of her. This ain't about this ain't this ain't about me and you. This is about L. Joy Williams. So let her go, fellas, fellas. We have I know. Made I'm it. sorry. We got company. Go ahead, we L. Joy. <laughs> we're sorry. Go ahead, love. <laughs> I love you guys. Okay, so then your other question. Um, it was about the sort of people understanding civics and the current president that we have and sort of what what gets us to this space, I think your question was. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, is, it a, is this a, is, is he, I mean, if he can pardon himself, is this a monarchy? No, still not yet. So, you know, I recently saw a quote and I need to find out who said um, who said this because it's really true um, that the founding fathers in the Constitution um, foresaw and put in provisions to prevent this kind of president. Um, but it didn't it didn't think that it needed to also put measures in place for this kind of Congress. Uh, because remember that the presidency, from a historical standpoint, um, we are at a time now where the presidency is powerful. The presidency has gained this power over time. It didn't start out that way. Um, the president was like a figurehead, <laughs> you know, of a leader. Um, and remember the, the the part of the founding of this country and the reason why we sort of separate ourselves, part of the reason in creating this presidency, they didn't want to create another structure um, of having this one person in charge of everything. And in, in terms of doing it, that's why they created this balance. And that's and Congress is supposed to be that check as well as the courts is supposed to be that check against that power. And so that no one entity could amass this power to sort of rule over the country. Well, so now we have a president that is not being checked by um, the entity, particularly Congress, that mm -hmm. was set up to keep it in check. And so when you have over time a particular position gaining this kind of power over, slowly over time, um, and now you have this powerful position. Um, I think it would be wonderful if Congress and the courts would be like, okay, let's fully operate in our power and keep this presidency in check. Um, but now you have a situation where you have the president um, in power in the same party as uh, the leadership of Congress. And people also just frankly very scared of their individual positions rather than thinking about the country and its people overall and how they keep that person in check. I mean, how long does this go on? I mean, are we, are we, are we really going to get four years of, you know, a Twitter, you know, president and, you know, calling people names and pardoning himself and white, white house shake us. I mean, are we going to get four years of this? Is this going to be nonstop for the next four to eight years with this administration or is impeachment really intact is that even possible or I, this is going to be the next four years of our lives entertainment so presidency from my from let me tell you what my plan is my plan is um for unless i see something different i see yes this happens in the next continues to happen in the next four years and which is part of the reason why I try to disconnect from the daily, what did he tweet, what did he right. say, who is he speculating, or whatever, and focus more or less on educating you, right. on educating more people around 
me on, I mean, when in September, I'm launching a whole national thing about, you know, people doing voter registration campaigns and people getting ID to vote. So like, while we are challenging voter ID laws in the courts, which we definitely should do, at the same time, I'm challenging people to like, while people are trying to challenge that, what I need you to do is help people in your community get ID, get registered, get a gun license, whatever they need to get. (laughs) <laughs> like, right, unless right. You want, right. You're right, because I saw. I mean, you know, I know you were on you you were on Karen Hunter, and I was listening to her today, and she was saying, you know, it's just so frustrating and it's so exhausting to continue to talk about Donald mm-hmm. Trump. And she was saying, you know, I don't want to talk about Donald Trump anymore because one, I think we all would agree that he's a liar, and it doesn't make any sense for us to continue to speak to the choir, right? We already know who he is and how he is as a president and how he's going to run this administration. It's better for us to, and which is one of the platforms for this podcast is to educate you about health and educate you about the finances and educate you about the things that you need to know in order for you to be, for you to be more knowledgeable for when you do go to the polls or how you can actually survive the unfortunate next four years of this, of this presidency. Cause it's like, man, this is, this is, this is amazing. You know, it's it, it's amazing. So well, let me let me let yeah. me go back real quick, Eljoy, before we before we wrap up and let you go. We know you got to get married, and we don't want nobody trying to be mad at us. What three <laughs> what three things are on your phone on your on your radio that you're listening to? That why is that would, so important? Be, because I want to <laughs> I want to hear what she got to say. Because I mean, we might be we might be thrown off that she's listening to some future. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll say in terms of podcast, and then I'll say in terms of music. Okay, so in terms of music, the other things that I listen to, there's a um, uh, another civic show called Civics One Hundred One. I listen to them. Um, I listen to Neil deGrasse and Neil deGrasse Tyson Star Talk mm-hmm. Radio. Um, that's the nerd in you yeah. coming out. That's the nerd in you coming yeah, out. That's nerd. Yo, that's, 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 that's nerdism, though. That's dope nerdism right there. Right, right, right. right. Um, and then I also listen to this is absolutely my favorite favorite podcast. It's called The Bowery Boys, um, and it's about New York City history. Um, you know, being a New Yorker. And so one of my favorite episodes I would recommend that you guys listen to um, is about the Civil War draft riots um, mm. in New York City. Um, really, really great episode. I really like if I had money, um, I would finance um, doing a, a, a series um, on that story. Like it's it's fascinating. Um, in terms of music, <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> um, um, obvious. I mean, so you know, I grew up in the you know, I'm not a millennial. Um, I'm near you know near forty, so um, I'm like in that weird like place that we're not quite millennials not quite like i guess generation xc i don't know what it is whatever or how that's done um but so you know i got jay-z and beyonce obviously um and then you know i'm a church girl also so i hope i have like you know church music and then anthony hamilton and you know so i'm boring in terms of like music and podcasts. I'm a nerd. Sorry. Doesn't sound boring to me. <laughs> Sounds very educational. You turn me on, turn me on to a couple of things and I appreciate the only thing that. She's, the only thing she's missing is a, a weekly dose of three black guys with a mic. Yeah, we got to put, you got yes. to, you got you to gotta put that yes. on your, uh, on your rotation. We got to get you well, on that no, rotation. You guys will now, you guys will now be on my rotation. Like when I do with an insanity check and you know, the MTR network and, um, uh, Rod and Karen, you know, on the Black Guys because so you guys will be on my my rotation there. And look, I'm gonna I'm I'm getting married, and then I'm gonna be on a cruise for seven days. I need something to listen to. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thirty to my episodes. Other, yeah, my 30 other activities. Episodes. My other activities. Whoa, whoa, boat, whoa, but... whoa, 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 <laughs> whoa, 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 uh, whoa. Eljoy, thank you so very much. Congratulations on your um on your wedding too. Um, have a great time. I love Puerto Rico. You know, if, if I tell my wife all the time, if, if there's any place that we would move, it would definitely be Puerto Rico. It's just a beautiful place. So have a great time in Puerto Rico. Congratulations again. Congratulations on all your success, you know, and everything that you're doing. Uh, I look forward to listening to you again on Karen Hunter in August. You know, uh, I'm a big fan of Karen Hunter. Um, and, you know, I look forward to seeing you again on, you know, the news outlets. And we'll definitely be, you know, listening to the podcast. Uh, is there anything right. that people, you know, what I'm saying need to know about you that's coming up that we didn't uh, discuss? No, I would just say, I would just ask everyone to, you know, visit 
the site, sundayscivics.org. You can get the uh, show anywhere you listen to your podcast. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. I tweet news. Um, that's not like in mainstream news every morning, every weekday morning, I tweet news and stories that you should be following and, you know, pay attention to. Um, so you can follow me on Twitter and, and, and I talk, I'm, I'm, I'm nice on Twitter. You can talk <laughs> to me on Twitter. Don't try to slide in my DMs though. Um, right. But, right. Cause you're getting married. <laughs> it all goes down in the DMs. Oh, you know, we can, have a, we, we can have a, you know, a general conversation. So right. even if we disagree. So, yeah. Cool. Well, enjoy your um wedding and your time off. I'm sure it's more than, you know, much deserves. And congratulations again. And uh, we look forward to talking to you again in the, in the future. When that book comes out, when that book comes out, we'll be talking to you again in the future. Uh, <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. All right. Have a great have night. Sunday Civics, right? You want to have us on Sunday Civics one time? I am. Actually, we do a series um uh, called First Civic Action. Um, so definitely um, my team will reach out to you where we interview people and ask them what their first civic action was. Um, so we'll definitely, when I come back, we'll, you know, touch base and, you know, have you guys on. Um, hopefully y'all don't act out too much. No. Nah. Uh, <laughs> it's Maynard. As you can see, I told you, it's the Maynard is the problem. Maynard. Yep. It's all Maynard. Maynard. That's, that's the, what's so the, get, that's the know, problem. <laughs> Get yourself well, together. You're right. Get crew, it together, man. Tell your crew we want to get with, you, with your crew, too. I mean, Melissa, Tamara, and the whole crew, we're going to get together. We have a good Hey, family. hey, this lady is trying to go on vacation, man. Yeah, man. Get yeah, back I'm up, man. Get, look, Eljoy, get... have a fantastic night. Enjoy your, <laughs> you know, enjoy your, you know, your man and your Puerto Rico and your, your trip and your cruise and all that. And we will talk to you in the future. Have a wonderful night, love. Thank you. <laughs> all right, bye. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so very much to Al Jory Williams for joining us on this episode of Three Black Guys with a Mic. Make sure you go to our Facebook page, join the conversation at www.facebook.com slash Three Black Guys with a Mic. You can also check us out at Three Black Guys with a Mic.com. Leave a comment, man. We'll talk about it on the show. We want you to be a part of the show. We'll be back next Tuesday with another episode of Three Black Guys with a Mic. Peace out.